Thank you for joining us. Here to participate in this discussion today are some of the elected officials who represent us. Please welcome Congressman Dave Loebsack, Senator Joe Bolcom, uh, Representative Mary Masher, Johnson County Supervisor Lisa Green Douglas, and Iowa City Mayor Bruce Teague. Before we begin the program, I want to take a moment to thank the rest of the League of Women Voters Advocacy Committee and the Public Policy Center staff who are co-hosting this event behind the scenes, as well as our media sponsor, Iowa City Channel 4. Let's begin. Each panelist was, was asked to address these questions during our discussion, and after this, we'll move to general questions. First, what is the best channel for communicating with you, and what are best practices for doing so? Second, how has COVID affected your ability to communicate your messages with your constituents? And third, how has COVID affected your ability to get feedback from your constituents? Let's begin with Congressman Dave Loebsack. Congressman. All right. Oh. No, all right. Thanks, Shannon. I appreciate it. And thanks, Pete, uh, for uh, doing this and uh, League of Women Voters as well. Uh, Pete's a really, really wonderful force there in Iowa City and at the University of Iowa, and he really puts on a lot of good uh, events like this. I really give him a lot of credit. And the league, uh, well, uh, they're wonderful. There's no question about that, all the things that the league has done over the years, public service, uh, things like this. Uh, I might be the briefest of all of you uh, because uh, I'll be leaving office soon. By January 3rd, I won't be in Congress any longer. Um, we're already beginning to wind down uh, our, our communications with our constituents at this point. Um, I did get a call from a state rep uh, the other day about someone who has a visa problem over in Newton. And uh, uh, hopefully we're gonna be able to help resolve that uh, before I actually leave office and our uh, staff leave office. Uh, but really the best way uh, to be in touch with us has always been uh, either via the phone uh, or to physical offices in Iowa City and Davenport or the website. Really the website's a very great way too. I often say that, um, uh, uh, when I was living in Iowa City, which I'm not any longer, uh, you could always see me at the High V on Muscatine Avenue um, uh, on a pretty regular basis. Uh, they all know my wife, Terry, better than they know me. But um, uh, I still go there, even though I live in Mount Vernon. Um, my mask and everything, uh, you know, you think you're going to be a little incognito, but forget that. Everybody knows who I am. And once I start talking, then they really know who I am. Uh, they recognize my voice, I guess. But um, uh, uh, that that face-to-face -face communication is really important. Uh, state rep, uh, supervisor folks, um, you know, local officials, uh, mayors, other city council members, they have that, I think that direct contact a lot more than I do. And that's why I've often said uh, in some ways their job is a lot harder than mine uh, because everybody knows their phone number, everybody knows where they live. Uh, and everybody sees them around a lot, or uh, that's likely to be the case. It's less so for a member of Congress who has 24 counties, but I was around a lot and talking to a lot of folks. Um, uh, COVID, you know, it really did affect our ability in, in many ways because we were not able to get out as much. Um, again, I got out a lot. That's why I, 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 I guess I take great pride in uh, all the times that I was able to get out into my 24 counties, 15 in the first district that I represented, and then 24 since then, since 2013. Um, it's just difficult to get out during the COVID, and that's something that I missed a lot. Uh, I didn't even want to be in a car with a staff member, uh, quite honestly. Um, I'm in generally good health, I believe. Uh, but I am going to be 68 next week. And so I'm in one of those categories, you know, where it's not very safe um, to be in close contact with a heck of a lot of people. Um, but of course, uh, I still was able, you know, to do a lot of Zoom meetings. I was able to meet with a lot of folks that way uh, from my home in Mount Vernon. Uh, that happened fairly quickly uh, and early on. And uh, I discovered that I wasn't too old for the technology. That was good. Um, if I just kind of put my mind to it. And uh, we had a lot of Zoom meetings. A quick story, uh, we were having an energy and commerce meeting and we had all these public health officials, you know, Fauci and all these folks. Um, and, and I knew when my turn was gonna come and I had set it up uh, downstairs in Terry's office because that seemed to be furthest away from the construction on the new house next door. Uh, you know, I didn't have a cat running around thankfully or a dog or whatever, but we had a lot of noise out there. And then all of a sudden the, the neighbors who mow our lawn started mowing the lawn uh, right outside the window where I was gonna be 
on for five minutes. Uh, luckily, not national TV. They, they cut away at that time. Uh, so I had to run out and tell these young folks, you know, uh, hey, look, I'm going to I'm going to be on you on a Zoom call here with uh, Anthony Fauci and all these people. I, I need you not to do this part of my lawn for a while, if, if you don't mind. Um, but uh, those are the kinds of complications that you have in a situation like that. Um, but the staff, they were able to get around some, but it was difficult. And, and so it, it, it really did constrain my ability to communicate with folks and vice versa. But I had more personal calls actually as a result of all that as well. And that was a, a good, I think a good thing about all of this. Um, a lot more people know my phone number than was the case before. And uh, I still to this day do not hesitate to call me. So uh, hopefully that's uh, the kind of things you're looking for. And I'm, I want to turn it over to some others. I hope I didn't talk too long, uh, but uh, I've enjoyed doing this. Uh, being in touch with my constituents and the staff have done a fantastic job. Uh, they're a big reason why I think um, uh, we did a really good job over 14 years staying in touch with people and serving people in the second district of Iowa. Thanks, Shannon. And thanks, Great. Pete. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, just one clarifying question. When you're talking about contacting your offices, I know I've talked to some people before who have wondered for uh, any of you who have multiple offices, does it matter which office they contact, particularly if you're in Washington, should they reach out to you there or should it always be among your, your local offices? Normally, it's better to start at the local level. And uh, obviously, if you're in Iowa City or somewhere near there, go through the Iowa City office um, and uh, in Davenport, go through the Davenport office. But, you know, we have um, a veterans person over in Davenport. We had a longtime person in Iowa City. So if someone calls for a veterans issue in Iowa City, they'll be referred to Brian over in the Quad Cities. And uh, he did a fantastic job. Virginia did all that work uh, prior to her leaving the office. And Rachel in the Iowa City office, for example, does the visa stuff. And so if we have somebody in another part of the district who contacts one of our local representatives in that area, uh, he or she will refer that person to Iowa City. So just a, any point of contact uh, will get you to where you need to go. Thank you very much. All right. Well, moving, moving on next for the standard battery of questions, as it were, uh, State Senator Joe Bolcombe. So, Good evening, everybody. Um, th thanks to the League of Women Voters and the Public Policy Center for bringing us together tonight to talk about this important topic of, of not only how we communicate, but how we can be best communicated with in our roles as elected officials. Um, you know, we, we, the internet was, uh, was invented, of course, a few years ago. And, you know, if you go back 10 years and ask the question of legislators that I've served with, what's the best way, way to communicate with you? We had members that continued to say, well, the phone's the best way or mail me, you know, send me a, send me a letter. And of course, as, as time's gone on, uh, email has taken over as probably the, the number one way that uh, in terms of being communicated with uh, for, for most of us probably. But uh, like anybody, if we go around, I think we're probably all gonna be pretty close, but it really depends on who your legislator is and, or, who, or who your legislators or your elected officials are and knowing what they uh, prefer, right? I mean, we all, we all have our preferences. Um, in terms of outgoing, folks are on Twitter, folks are on, on Facebook, people have legislative newsletters, city newsletters, county newsletters. Um, folks have websites, right? But in terms, so that, that's one way that we use to tell people what we're up to. Um, but in terms of people getting in touch with us, I think emails is by far the best. There's of course people I, I get tweeted at occasionally. People send me instant messages on Facebook occasionally. But uh, probably the most efficient way is email. I'm on it a lot. We get a, a lot of, I get a lot of constituent concerns. It's really easy to send and forward somebody's constituents concern about something at the Department of Revenue or Department of Human Services to my staff in Des Moines and get a really prompt answer as opposed to somebody calling me on the phone and telling me their long story about their problem. And then I'm like, not, I don't get it all right and I'm trying to communicate it. So I always encourage people to use email in terms of like complicated constituent stuff. In terms of how COVID's affected uh, my communication or interaction with constituents, it's, it's uh, really been good news, bad news. As Congressman Loebsack said, uh, we're not seeing people as much, you know, at the grocery store or 
downtown or a coffee shop. And we just came through a set of campaigns where we, during campaign cycle, we'd all be seeing each other all the time and seeing, seeing friends and constituents. And of course, none of that happened, nor have we really done any, I've not really done any face-to-face -face meetings. Um, on the other hand, um, Zoom was invented. And uh, over the last six months, people have really figured out how to use it, although we don't always turn our mics on when we should. Um, and I, I have constant Zoom meetings and they are very, a very, very efficient platform uh, to interact with folks. And this fall, as we get closer to the legislative session, we get invited to all sorts of meetings and I, I can't always go to them because one's in Davenport or Cedar Rapids at different times. And now there's no excuse not to go to every one because you don't have to leave your home and you're able to jump on and, 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 and interact with people that way. So that's been, that's actually been a really nice innovation. Today, I've had four different Zooms on four different issues with constituents where you can just literally set up a half an hour meeting, be very personal uh, and, and get and communicate quite well. So it's, it's been really good, uh, I think in that way, even though it's been a challenging in a challenging time. I think looking ahead, Zoom is gonna, is gonna, it's not gonna go away and it's gonna be here. We're getting ready to go back to legislative session and I'm sure that uh, Zoom is gonna be a big part of trying to stay in touch with constituents uh, through, through the new year. So I'll stop with that and look forward to any questions. Great, thank you very much. Uh, next on our lineup is uh, Representative Mary Masher. Thank you. It's good to see everybody and thanks for inviting us to participate tonight. Um, I was just going to add that um, depending on the issue, um, today I was helping a constituent uh, for a nonprofit in Iowa City who had gotten some of the dollars from the CARES Act for their individual company and business, um, but they had not received the dollars yet and they had to be spent before the end of December. And so they were concerned about that in terms of, are we gonna be able to get it in time to be able to, to utilize it for the people who need it the most? So they had contacted me, I contacted the governor's office, we contacted Iowa Workforce Development and they are receiving their money. So those are kind of acts that we can get involved in and help because there was a hiccup in the system. And sometimes you have to shake some trees and rattle some branches in order to, to get that money to come to where it needs to be. So if it is something like that, where it's an individual issue or a problem, then obviously picking up the phone and calling us is just the best way to go or texting us because sometimes we are on those Zoom calls as Joe mentioned, and those Zoom calls are really important. And obviously we've been meeting with many constituency groups through Zoom this fall and obviously this winter. And it's been very effective and efficient, but email is by far the best way, unless it's something that you need immediately help, immediate help with. And then I would say, um, call us. And our numbers are pretty readily available and we're pretty good about getting back to people as soon as we can. So I'll stop there, thanks. Great, thank you very much. All right, uh, let's move then over to uh, Johnson County Supervisor, Lisa Green Douglas. Lisa, welcome here. Uh, thank you, <laughs> Shannon, and thank you to the League of Women Voters and to the um, University of Iowa Public Policy Center. This is kind of fun and new to me and very, very timely topic. I think that, um, Things have changed quite a bit for the Board of Supervisors in terms of the amount of communication we've gotten during um, our closures and such. And to me, it almost feels like we've had more engagement from the public. I think it's more a matter of, uh, it's more topic related, um, but I also think that because of our building closures, every single meeting we've had um, it's reiterated that we urge people to join us in a number of ways and we and those are read before every meeting and you know you hear the phone ding in and you know if somebody's there they don't always um, 
mention themselves at all. They don't speak up necessarily during public comment, but you hear a lot of people there that might not necessarily show up at a meeting. And I think it's partly, it's, it's easier to call in and just listen. Um, also people are at home and they have that time available when we're meeting. Um, we've had a lot more emails. Now, again, that's also topic driven, issue driven. Um, sometimes there are things that are very important to a certain constituency. During this, we have had lots of emails about a number of things, but again, about um, some current um, topics such as our COVID response, mask mandates. Um, there's always the roads, always roads and speed limits, but um, Black, Matter, Black Lives Matter and our, our responses to that. And um, I feel almost like we've gotten more emails about um, a variety of topics than we do normally. So I think people are engaged because there are different ways that they can be engaged and they have the time or the availability because of working from home. Um, but the best way for me is to get email um, at work. Uh, we are always trying to be cautious if it comes to all of the board, we have to be cautious on how we reply and not reply all so that we don't have an online quorum. But that is by far the best way. A phone call is, is for us, or for me personally, actually the second best way. Um, we have people, or we've in the past had people show up in our meetings. Sometimes people come during public comment. That's another great way, but email as, as um, Senator Volcom mentioned is by far the, I think the quickest and um, most likely to get a speedy reply. Right. Thank you very much. Could you say a little bit more about the uh, the online quorum? Tell us a little bit more about that concern. Oh, certainly. So uh, as a board, there are five of us. So when any three of us are together, we have to be cautious about what we talk about. So we talk about a lot of um, general chat things, baseball, our gardens, our pets. Um, we can't talk about matters that we make decisions on if we're not in a public meeting. So the same thing happens in an email format. If we're responding to someone and more than, or three or more of us respond, we immediately have what is a public meeting and we would be in violation of a, um, the um, open meetings rules. So we don't hit reply all. I learned that my first day, I replied all to an email about our, our pictures being taken and said, yes, that's a great time for me. And I got three responses within 15 minutes telling me don't ever do that again. <laughs> so I've been very careful about that. So okay. it, it's all just, it's for transparency purposes and for making sure that whatever we do and discuss regarding um, policy or decision-making is done openly in a very transparent way and where the public has access to it. Thank you. I, I can imagine how that would make an impression. <laughs> oh, it did. <laughs> oh. All right. Next, Iowa City Mayor Bruce Teague. Mayor Teague, welcome here and thank you for participating. Very excited to be here with everybody tonight and happy holidays. I know that it's, um, we're in the, the holiday season and when it comes down to communication, uh, what is the best ways to communicate uh, with me personally, or, and I'll probably even talk about our council a little bit uh, throughout this uh, response as well, is people have used all, all forms of communication. Uh, certainly Zoom has been probably um, the, the most novel, the newest for many people. Uh, some people haven't been tech savvy prior to COVID and have become, uh, have become wise as to how to navigate it a little bit, right? Uh, as we all have in some fashion. So definitely reaching out by um, phone is a popular way as well. Uh, taking phone calls is a very usual for me. 
Um, one of the things that I do miss is those, uh, you know, just meeting face to face with a lot of individuals, but Zoom has worked out for that opportunity to see people as you're speaking to them when you would normally meet face to face. There's been a lot of opportunities for um, engagement. Um, I feel as uh, uh, Lisa does, there's been more engagement uh, during this COVID time. I've had multiple, multiple meetings um, back to back and I wouldn't have had the ability to do that um, had I not been virtual in a way and can jump from one meeting to another meeting to another meeting. Um, I've been engaged with a lot of students, which has been great, both elementary, high school, and even at the college level. Um, so, uh, and, and they all had, came with different um, topics that they wanted to discuss. And it was great to learn about um, many of our students. Some of them have projects that I enjoyed learning about, and that was the topic of our, of our time together. Many people wanted to know, how do I get more engaged with the city? Um, and so I, I think even though COVID happened, right? COVID is still here. Uh, communication is still happening. And, and I would agree that um, a lot of the topics has to do with whatever, the, whatever is happening within our community. Um, COVID definitely, from the beginning of uh, when COVID first came to our community, um, I, I've been engaged with people about COVID, whether it's through um, phone, email, lots of emails, lots and lots of emails. Um, and, but there are, there are a few people that write letters um, and they'll, in the letter they'll, they'll, they'll mention that, you know, I'm not, I don't have a computer. I don't even have a cell phone. Some people don't have a cell phone and they'll just want to respond either talking about COVID or Black Lives Matter, the mask order, uh, given their uh, communication that way. Um, so there, there are a few people that do that. Um, I've just been very fortunate that um, I've quickly, I, I, knew, I knew Zoom prior to COVID, which was great. I had got introduced to Zoom probably about five years ago or four years ago, somewhere in there. And so I had been on the platform so I knew how to work it. So it was a little less of a learning curve for me um, than, than for, for some others. And so I think, again, when people are wanting to reach out to me my, uh, or council, uh, we have um, very, you know, the common ways to reach out to us. I know that our counselors um, have been busy a little more this year uh, engaged with the community than in a typical year. But I think we've had so many uh, important things come up in our community. Derecho, you know, that came up. And so um, I, people have been reaching out a little bit more. Thank you very much. Um, for those who are joining us on Zoom or on Facebook, I'm going to encourage you to leave us any questions that you have in the Q&A on Zoom or in the comments on Facebook. We'll be collecting those and moving on. Uh, one question that I have for the panel before we move through to review those uh, is that email has come up as an important channel of communication from pretty much everybody on here and specific to advocacy when we're at when we're um, contacting you to encourage you to either consider new legislation or to have an opinion about a current issue. Uh, when we're sending those emails, what are things that you look look for or alternatively, is there something that's not helpful that we should know when we're just to, to make that an effective communication? Um, if I can just say, um, when it comes to Congress, you know, there are a lot of organized campaigns uh, to send emails on a particular topic and something that's really a, a hot item of the day. Um, you know, if we, for example, if we get 200 emails on a particular issue in a day and 95% of them uh, or 90% or four, let's say the issue, and they all sound exactly the same. What that means is that it's uh, it's been a clicking thing, you know, right? You get you get emails say, "Hey, click here and tell your congressman," blah blah blah. It's not that we don't take those seriously, but you have to take into account that it is an organized campaign. It's a lot easier for someone to, to just click on that and it automatically the same email that somebody you know 30 seconds ago sent 
uh, goes in. So we have to be a little bit careful about that. I'm not saying uh, everything that we pay more attention to is more personalized, but it does make some difference. Um, that's just the only thing I would say. Uh, I think email's really, really important. There's no question about that. Clearly in the case of Congress, if you send a letter to us by regular postal mail, postal service, it's going to take a long time to get there. It's got to go through a lot of security channels and all the rest. Keep that in mind. And uh, it, it may not get to my office uh, in D.C. or Iowa City for quite some time because of that, especially in D.C., that security that it's got to go through. So email really is the most effective way to do it. There's no question about that. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else like to uh, add comments? I'll go. Um, uh, following on what uh, Congressman Lobsack said on the, the click type emails, um, I think that, it, again, it's not that those aren't um, important topics or that um, they're not paid attention to, but I think it's really important for people who send those to perhaps do a little bit of fact checking mm -hmm. because sometimes um, there might be something in it that maybe isn't quite tailored to the um, entity that you're sending it to, um, or it might not be something that's within our purview. And I think that uh, oftentimes what happens is that, um, you know, there are three of us here, at least, that are former educators. I, I often look at emails that we get, and sometimes there's a teaching moment available on letting people know what we are able to do, what's under our umbrella of authority, and if it's not directing them where they're going to get um, some um, action maybe taken on the topic that is of interest to them. And that happened a lot when we were asking, when people were asking us about the mask mandate. And uh, we learned very quickly, and, and so many of us didn't know this ourselves, but we learned that, for example, the Board of Supervisors, it's in Iowa code. We do not have any authority there, but city mayors do. <laughs> and then like the Board of Health does. So we really had to talk to people about that and, and help them understand what we could do and what we couldn't do. So um, on the click type things, do a little fact checking, maybe change the wording a little bit so that um, it is tailored to the um, person you're sending it to. And, um, I think that oftentimes when you've got some advocacy going on, there's an ask there. If you, if a person could provide a very brief history of the issue, where we're at now, and then the ask. Um, and, and that could be done in a concise way that is really helpful. And then we can address it from that angle. Yeah, I would I would say just in general, all the email I get, and I think Representative Masher and probably Congressman Lobsack same, it's um, the most important thing, and and for our, for our local elected officials too is is this where, who is this person? Where do they live? Do they live in my legislative district? Do they live in Johnson County? You know, because uh, for members of the legislature, we get a lot of email from people all over the state on interesting issues, and Congressman probably gets stuff from outside his congressional district. And when you get a lot of email, you wanna absolutely respond to your constituents. They're, they're the priority. And if I've got time, I might send email to people that aren't in my, in my, in Johnson. I think of my district actually as Johnson County. So I respond to everybody in Johnson County, but that's the first thing that I do when, my, when I have a clerk during the legislative session, it's like doing a little CSI on the email to see, is this somebody that we need to be, you know, be on top of, respond to, right? So that's that's one. That's probably that's probably the biggest rule of sending something to a legislator. Let them know where you live. Let them know your phone. You know how to get a hold of you. On the issue of like mass emails, we get a lot of them. Maybe you know <clears throat> during a legislative session, there are maybe twenty issues that we get a hundred or more emails on. Some of those emails are generated automatically on topics like gun control or on abortion or whatever the issue is. 
and those go into a folder because typically you'll have a day or two where you'll get these hundred emails because people are out looking, they're, they're getting sent email by organizations pushing concepts. And I respond to those. And again, I look at those. The first thing I look at is this from somebody in my district, whether it's an automated you know, you know, email that's generated on a particular topic. And I don't, I respond to those. I don't respond with individual replies, you know, unique. If I get a hundred emails, I'm not doing a hundred unique replies, but I will write a detailed reply that will go out to all 100 emails when the, when there's something to report, um, you know, a few days later, oh, okay, the bill's been introduced or we're going to debate the bill or we just voted on the bill. I tried to send out a note to update people. And again, you know, people are so busy that, you know, they're, they're, they're at home at night. They have this issue they care about. They don't have time to write a six paragraph email to you with a lot of research. And this is a really fairly effective way for them to share their view with very little effort. So I know sometimes people are down on those emails who think they're not, not as, as important as other emails, but I think they do represent something to pay attention to. And I do. And I was just gonna comment that I like it when you personalize it in terms of how does it affect you and why are you taking the time to contact us? So if you can personalize it, it really does make a difference. And I do like that um, and feel that that's a more effective way to lobby. So I would encourage folks to do that. Um, the is I'm amazed at all of the clickbait that is not from here and not from Iowa. And they claim they are. And when you start doing that research, as Joe said, you find out they're not, they don't live in our districts. They, they aren't in the van. They haven't you know, they're not registered to vote They're And you're just kind of puzzled and thinking, well, this is a, a scheme or a way to get um, attention to an issue, but not necessarily from Iowans or from our constituents. So I, I'd be leery about that and cautious because we've seen that happen quite a bit. And I just wanted to caution people on that. Thanks. One thing I've really appreciated is all of the emails that are, that are, really detailed because you don't totally have to guess what the in information they're wanting you to gather. Um, but I also want to just bring out a point that um, people should email or, or feel free to email even if you're not the best writer or uh, you feel like you won't be able to express yourself clearly. I think um, I, I would encourage people to do that. One of the things when we're talking about um, being when we want to be equitable um, we want everybody to have space and opportunity um, through whatever fashion they see. And so I would encourage people to email. The other thing that I might mention is, at least for me personally, this isn't the situation, but um, many people do personal attacks on the elected official in emails. Um, a long time ago, um, I, I remember just being in church and my, my aunt uh, us kids were laughing. We were just laughing. There was something happening. And so my aunt looked at us and uh, she was so serious, like she was engaged in the service. And, and she said, you all need to look past the person and get the message. And so uh, I abide by that rule a lot in my life where um, no matter how, uh, how people are speaking uh, towards me, uh, or to me, I, I, I really try to get the message, the personal attacks on who I am. Most, you know, some of the people have never met me, um, have never talked to me on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, probably, I, I've even known some people that just know they read an article and they, in, and they call and, and they want to do personal attacks. But that's what I would say is um, for elected officials, it's probably um, it will be appreciated a little more. I believe if, if personal attacks wouldn't happen, and but you still get your point across, certainly call us out. Um, I'm not saying don't call us out, but sometimes I think uh, people may go a little bit, uh, what I would consider a little bit too far in naming character on topics. Thank you, everyone. We're starting to build up a bank of questions here. But before we move on to questions from the audience, can I ask you, any of you have questions for each other? 
I don't know how common it is to have a collection of government officials that have crossed quite as much of the strata here, but if so, it feels like a great time for a conversation. I wanted to ask uh, Senator Welcome when he said that he looks to see if um, someone is a constituent. And while in general, I understand that when you all are getting ready to vote on something that has statewide impact, do you do the same? Is it the same at that point or is it just when they're introducing a topic? Um, yeah, I, it's a good question. I, um, you know, it's, you, you try and respond the best you can to what your constituent, you know, what your constituents want you to do. You, you, most of the time I sleep pretty comfortably. Occasionally there's a, an issue that I'm like conflicted on where I have people that I respect and with opinions on both sides of issues. So that, that can be a, a little bit more challenging. Um, but, um, you know, you, you just try and get the best information you can as you make, as you make decisions about things. And you, you know, over time, you, you develop some trusted advisors in, uh, across a whole host of different kinds of issues to rely on for good advice. Any others? Well, well, I would just say to Congressman Lobsack, of course, you're you're on your way out of here. Um, of course, we thank you for all you've done. Um, one of the one of the things that I would like to know from you is, because you have such a large area, what has been the most effective way for you to communicate when each community is so different? That's a great question. Well, uh, I think the best thing is to get out as much as possible, first and foremost, which the pandemic uh, really restricted, obviously, me from doing. Um, coffees with your congressman, uh, all that. Uh, you know, every year I'd have seven, at least a few hundred meetings with my constituents around the 24 counties. Uh, some cases, some years, even more than that. A lot of coffees with your congressman. Um, I sort of uh, eschewed the large town hall meetings. Um, I didn't find them to be particularly, pr particularly productive. Um, and, and the constituents uh, didn't find them to be productive. You'd have a lot of people grandstanding and, and all the rest. Uh, when, you know, those people were kind of more serious about it, um, uh, not taking anything away from the grandstanders necessarily, but those who wanted to have more intimate conversations couldn't do it. Uh, and so those coffees with your congressman are really, really great. And uh, people would come and we just sit down at the table and talk about the issues. Sometimes if we had more than, uh, you know, half a dozen or a dozen people, we'd have to sort of get everybody around the table or something, but, um, and it turned into kind of a mini town hall, but that, that was a very good way to do it. Um, and I found, and, and it literally drove people crazy from time to time on both sides of the aisle. Um, I just had to be who I was and, you know, offer my best explanation as to why uh, I took a particular vote or was thinking about a, a particular vote in a particular way, but I would always ask people for their input. Um, and, you know, when you have a district that's got 24 counties and it includes Johnson County uh, and Decatur County uh, and uh, Davis County, I don't know if, if you folks know exactly where those are. Uh, uh, probably the legislators do, no offense, Bruce uh, or Lisa, but um, uh, it's, it's a challenge because, uh, especially here in DC, when I'm trying to talk to my colleagues about my district, they, they have no idea that a district in Iowa can be as diverse as the congressional districts here are. Up in Northwest Iowa, that's not so uh, that's not quite as diverse, but certainly in, in my district, I mean, it's exceedingly diverse. And, you know, I get, I get all kinds of different, different viewpoints on different issues. And um, it's quite amazing when you think about it. And, you know, you, you have to, eventually you want to win, district wide, uh, but you got to do your best to represent as many of these people as possible. And, uh, you know, you just have to make the tough decisions. Like Joe said, you know, you know, you want to be able to sleep at night and live with yourself. Um, sometimes that's hard to do uh, when you have a, a district like mine, but in the end you do your best and, and then you hope you don't get assaulted too much, the uh, high V on Muscatine, you know, so. 
Yeah, I, I, had a, I actually had a question for Mayor Teague and Supervisor Green Douglas. So since, since both of the city council and the board of supervisors have moved from in-person meetings to a virtual format, how has that challenged the, you know, the small group dynamic of the city council with seven members and, and the board with five, the kind of just the interactions of doing business and, you know, kind of the camaraderie of a group dynamic and all and, and the like. So we've been doing our meetings um, by telephone and through most of the, the year, um, there were two supervisors present in the boardroom, um, the chair and vice chair and three calling from home. Um, I had a personal situation going on. And so when that was, when that changed, I started going back in. Um, but as you know, I was going to say, Joe, as you know, Senator Volcom, you know the boardroom quite well and how it's set up and it um, looks bigger up there where we sit than it actually is. So with even with four of us, it was um, impossible to distance. So with three of us, we can um, space ourselves accordingly. And the other two call in um, our committee meetings, liaison meetings, everything else has been by Zoom. And um, it has worked mostly well, I would say. Um, I was grateful for the opportunity to be able to work from home during uh, much of this year. At City Council, it's been uh, 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 interesting because we've had lots of community engagement still. Um, through Zoom, people get on and, and we first used to allow people to be visibly seeing the, the, the attendees of our meetings, but now we just allow their voice to come up, but counselors uh, can certainly see each other. Uh, one of the things is sometimes there's a little delay. And so you might have another counselor talking at the same time for a couple of seconds and then realize someone else is talking. Um, so, you know, that's been a, a little bit of, of the hurdle of not being in person because typically you're looking at each other and you're talking. Um, body language, um, I, I think, speaks to people as well. And so Zoom doesn't totally capture all of that. But I will say that I've, I've been very grateful for it. I do believe that there are some people that were engaged with our city on a more routine basis that um, maybe they have some reservations about doing electronic meetings or um, just hadn't been on. I think sometimes for some people, the, the hardest part is just to get online and, and get connected. And so I, I do fear that there's a few people out there that were routine attendees of our meetings that aren't present. So i um, very grateful for Zoom and for the ability for uh, our city staff who has been um, champions <laughs> in uh, navigating um, the meetings for us and making sure that everything goes smooth and syncing it up with Facebook and um, other social media outlets as well. All right, well, I'll shift over to questions. There are some coming across and one or two that have already been uh, answered in the Q&A, but for those of us who are following us in other venues and excellent questions though, we'll submit them for a general discussion. Uh, first off, what advice would you give to anyone who would like to be more involved in public policy? Mary, can I start you with this one since you already have a typed response to it and see what other people respond to it as well? Sure, um, we're so glad when people are engaged and interested in public policy and are willing to take the time to learn about the issues. It's one of the things that the league does so well. Um, you take an issue, you do a deep dive in terms of the history of that issue, why it's important, what you would like to see done, where are the problems and where are the issues in terms of what, why we can't get it accomplished and then helping us with identifying um, who we need to talk to and who we need to work with to try to get it accomplished. So I, I look at, you know, you're kind of the model 
uh, league in terms of how to go about that. And you've done that on everything from the bottle bill to um, water quality, uh, soil quality, those kinds of things that are really important. So anyone who is interested in public policy, whether it's at the city, at the state, at the county, whatever level, the congressional level, please talk to us and let us know what the issues are. And we can sometimes give you background information on why it has been held up in the House or the Senate. And Joe can attest to this. I'm sure Dave and Lisa and um, Bruce can as well. Sometimes it's an individual. You've got somebody who might be the chair of a committee that can block something. And we find that all the time. And then we find out that they have a basically a vested interest in blocking that legislation. And that's why they should do so. So public policy is, a, is interesting regardless of the issue. Um, you can usually find out why it has not moved forward when you start asking the questions about who is blocking it or who is supporting it. And then you can get a lot of answers and questions answered. So um, I would just encourage people to meet with us and talk to us about the policy that you're interested in. And then we can lend you some information about the background on that issue. Yeah, if I could follow up on that, that's great, Mary. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, and people can call me Dave, by the way. I don't need to be called Congressman, just so you know. Uh, and I've known all of you for a long time. Uh, but uh, at any rate, um, uh, it's harder at the congressional level, obviously, um, to, to have you know, an impact uh, as an individual. And really what we're talking about here, by the way, is lobbying uh, your representative. And lobbying is not a bad word necessarily. All it means is advocacy. And that's what we're talking about here. Uh, this is the one thing Steve, Steve King and I, probably the only thing that we actually agree on, uh, that lobbying is not necessarily a bad thing. It's a good thing, it's advocacy. It depends on how it, how it happens and, and uh, uh, you know, whether there's something beyond just sort of simple advocacy. But I would just suggest, um, if you're an individual out there and you have a particular issue that, that you're concerned about, sure, be in touch with the office, but do some research too, because you may be able to find on your own some kind of group or, or groups that are advocating for what you're advocating for, and then try in some way to hook up with them, because that's going to be the best way to sort of have a critical mass, especially at the congressional level, um, and, and uh, to, to, to bring pressure to bear on uh, your representative in Congress. That really is the best way to do it. Organization, organization is really important. And, and that's one of the things that I miss, you know, because of the pandemic is people coming to Washington, DC, groups of folks coming into my office, sitting around uh, representing perhaps thousands of other people who have the same concerns that they do. And you might be one of those people. So do your best to try to do some research. Um, I hate to say anytime just Google something, but you might have to do that, whatever your concern is. And you might very well find that there are organizations out there that you can hook up with and then uh, they will help advocate for you as well. Thanks. Mayor Teague, I noticed you're off mute. Were you gonna add to this one? Um, I, I certainly can. One of the things I think about are commissions and groups um, when it comes down to public policy, because sometimes you can be a part of that uh, human rights commission. And, and even at the state level, there's a, a, a lot of uh, different groups that meet. Sometimes they may meet to, um, to create uh, a program for the state or a, a new uh, get input from the public. So that would be one way to really become engaged in and involved in public policy. All right. I have one that I'm going to direct and that seems to me directed particularly toward uh, legislators, which is, uh, is there a point at which sort of it's too late where for pre uh, in this on legislation where tallies of votes have been taken and at that point it's a lot more difficult to sway votes? I can start with that. Um, obviously, there are two chambers, and so it has to pass both chambers, right, in identical form, 
and then it has to go to the governor's office. So there are three different steps along the way in terms of both chambers and the governor's office having a say, but you also have all kinds of opportunities um, in subcommittee and then before and after it goes to committee, before it goes to the floor. So there are lots of different steps along the way. And obviously at any one of those steps, um, legislation can be blocked or stopped or advocated for and passed because of where it is in the process. So um, I would never hesitate to tell people, please you know, continue to contact us. Um, there may be hiccups along the way in either chamber or the governor may be one that does not want that legislation. So you don't know always until you've had the opportunity to weigh in and uh, at least let people know what you think or how you feel about that issue. Joe, anything else? Well, you know, every issue is different. I think Representative Masher has done a good job of describing kind of the, pro the process stuff of, you know, th these things have to happen for a bill to become law. But every, every issue is different. It depends on who's for it and who's against it, uh, not only in the lobby, but who the legislators are where there might be this really bad idea that everybody would say, well, we shouldn't do that, but there's no way in heck you're gonna stop it because it's got the right lobby behind it and the right legislators supporting it, the majority members. So every issue is different, you know, 80% of stuff is, is pretty bipartisan and 20% of stuff we fight about or just have, have you know, respectful disagreement about. Um, but it, it, there's also, beside just the kind of the nuts and bolts of the process, every issue has its own uh, unique attributes that either make it something you can make change to or something that you're going to get run over by. I was just going to add really a quick note too. Joe and I both know and others too that nothing is ever really dead. Um, we're amazed sometimes at the things that pop up in appropriations bills or issues that we thought had been settled and were done and then come back in another form uh, in an appropriations or uh, another bill that's being debated that really has nothing to do with that issue. Um, uh, so I, I wanted just to caution people to let you know that um, that's why you should never stop <laughs> because it can come back in another form and we often see that. Looks like we have time for one more question. And so one that has also popped up in the chat and again, for other consider consideration all, and uh, for those online, is it helpful to receive or get positive sort of high five emails from constituents or just wanna get emails about communi and communications about concerns? Well, that's a, that's a solid round of, thounds, sound, of thumbs up. All right. Well, we are close enough to time. I don't think we have time for any of these other ones that have come up. So thank you everyone for joining us today. It has been a great discussion. Um, thank you again to all of our elected officials for taking the time to serve as panelists. Thank you to Iowa City Channel 4 for live streaming and recording this evening's activity. Uh, you can visit City Channel 4 to see, the, to see viewing times or visit our website, uh, www.lwvjc.org, League of Women Voters, Johnson County, uh, or our Facebook to view online. As a short reminder, the League of Women Voters will, hope, will host legislative forums on the last Saturday on the months of January, February, February and March, beginning at 9.30 a.m., uh, those can be viewed online, and for information about future PP, P, Public Policy Center and programming, please visit our websites and social media. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks. It was wonderful to see everybody. Happy Be holidays. Safe. Thanks. <laughs>